I'm doing good. I got to worship twice today. And it's only, what, 1030. I'm in good shape. <laughs> if you ever want to do that, you can come at 9 o'clock and worship in Spanish and then come at 10 and worship in English. I'm promising you, you're going to enjoy it even if you don't understand it. Right? <laughs> he, he can testify to that. <laughs> well, it's so good to be here with you. I thank you all for your prayers. I know you've been praying for me. Uh, I'm getting old, and things are happening to my body that I don't understand. So uh, now they require surgery to fix them. <laughs> Before they just require rest, right? Now it's like, wow. But I appreciate all your prayers, and uh, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Um, keep praying for us, because we'll keep getting older. So I can get any better than this. <laughs> you know, if this is the best I'm going to feel from here on, that, that's pretty sad. <laughs> but, but we're glad to be here. But we're going to be in Mark 15, chapter 15 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to get ready and get prepare for us. We're going to continue talking about the last 24 hours of Jesus. And we're going to be in the part of the trial. Okay? So I want to start this morning with a question for you. What do you do... When you're confronted with truth, I want you to think about that. How, how do you respond to truth? I think we can only do three things with truth. We can ignore it, we can reject it, or we can accept it. Right? And uh, you're going to hear me say throughout it all that if you ignore it or reject it, it's pretty much the same thing. It gives you pretty much the same results. At any given time, all of us are confronted with truth. And we have to make a decision at that time. We have to decide whether to ignore it, to confront it, to accept it, or to reject it. And so the point of it is, is this, that once you're confronted with truth, there must be something you must do. There was once an African chief that happened to visit a mission station and hanging outside the missionary's hut on a tree was a little mirror. And the chief happened to look into the mirror and saw his reflection, complete with the terrifying paint and the, the threatening features. He gazed at his own frightening countenance and started back in horror, exclaiming, who is that horrible looking person inside that tree? Oh, the missionary said, it's not in the tree. The glass is reflecting your own face. The African will not believe it until he held the mirror in his hand. He said, I must have the glass. How much would it be to, go, to buy it? And the missionary said, well, I, I don't want to sell it, really. But the, the chief begged him until he capitulated and thinking that it might be best to sell it than and to have some trouble in his hands. So he named the price, and, and the Indian took the mirror, exclaiming, I will never have it making faces at me again. And he threw it on the floor and broke it. As we continue examining the last 24 hours of Jesus before his death by crucifixion, we come to this passage in Mark 15, and we'll see a number of people that were confronted with the truth and decided to break the mirror and reject it instead of embracing it and allowing it to change their lives. Um, I remember some 28 years ago, I was confronted with, with certain truth in my life as I started coming to this church. I was a, I was a weak father. I was a horrible husband. I was a... Just an average employee at that time in my life. Um, and at that point, I started coming to the small group. There was six men, six of us that met every Thursday morning. And, and part of the agreement to be in the group was that we were going to be completely open and completely honest with each other. We were going to be transparent and speak the truth and then accept whatever came back from that, you know. Um, you know, and... and these men revealed these truths to me, and I, I could have ignored them or rejected them and continued living like I was living. I could have said, hey, it's a Puerto Rican thing, man. I was born there. I, that's the way we do it, and if you don't like it, tough luck. And that would have been devastating, not only for me, but for my family and my marriage. 
But instead, I, I decided to accept those truths, and uh, I repented of them. I admitted them, and I allowed that to change my life. And not only my life, but it also changed my family's life. So today, you may be facing some truths in your, in your life. And perhaps you've been ignoring them and saying, you know what, at the end it will all pan out. It will work all right. Or maybe you've rejected them and saying, that's the way we do things. That's the way I was raised. And so I don't care about the truth because this is my truth. Or perhaps you're looking at the world and say, everybody's doing it, so why not me? Well, in life we can do those things. We can reject. We can ignore some truths, even though I don't recommend it. But there is most of the truths that we face in our life we can't do that with. We have to do something about it. And it's better for you to respond to your truth than, than, than to let, you know, uh, somebody else decide for you or let fate determine what the outcome will be. So as we open our Bibles in Mark 15, I want you to keep that in your mind. How do I respond or how should I respond when I'm faced with truth? So Mark 15, verse 1, it says... And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they're bringing against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner from whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man named called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, but why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, washing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Let's pray. Lord God, Father, this morning as we open up your word, Father, we know... That it's impossible with the help, without the help of the Holy Spirit to understand your word, Lord. Father, it's impossible to understand the implications in our lives from what we read in your word without your help, Lord. So today, Father, I ask that you speak to us individually, Lord. Open our hearts, our spiritual ears, Father. Open our minds that we will hear your word, that we will understand your word, Father, and that we will apply your word to our lives, Lord. Father, please don't allow my humanness to interfere with your message this morning. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, in this chapter of Mark, in verse 1, we pick up the story actually at the last phase of the religious trial of Jesus. See, they had, it went through three phases, this trial, and we're picking it up on the third phase of that, on the last one, and in the transition from the religious trial to the civil trial in front of Pontius Pilate. Now, I, I think it's important to know as a reference that the real religious trial had already happened during the night. And you can read that on Mark 14. When Jesus was arrested on Mark 14, they took him straight to the religious leaders. You can find the details of that part of the trial in John 18 as well, 13 to 24. But at that stage, Jesus first appeared before Annas, or Anas. Uh, I'm not sure of the pronunciation of that name. But, but Annas had been a high priest. 
from 6 AD to 15 AD. And at the moment, he wasn't the high priest. But for some reason, he must have had power over the Jewish people because they first took Jesus to him. Well, his meeting with, uh, with Jesus was really unproductive, unfruitful. And so he sends Jesus to the current high priest, which is Caiaphas. And so Jesus appears before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. That part of the trial, you see it in Mark 14, verses 53 to 65. And Jesus appears before Caiaphas at night. And that is important because it was unlawful for the Jewish people to have a, tr a trial during the night. Okay, they were supposed to do it during the day so people can show up and make sure there was a fair trial. But they did this one at night. So that trial was really a mockery of their judicial system. Here you have the, the, the high priest, the supreme court, if you will, the Sanhedrin of the Jewish people violating their own laws to have a trial at night in secret so that they can condemn an innocent man. False testimonies were, were levied against Jesus. And they were so ridiculous, they were so bad that they couldn't even convict them of the false testimonies that they made up. But they kept pressing the issue. They kept pressing on Jesus and pressing on Jesus. And in verse 61 of chapter 14, they ask him this question. They say, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? And Jesus simply looked at them and said, I am. And there it was. All of a sudden, herein lies the entire basis of their accusation against Jesus. Jesus says, yes, I am the son of God. Blasphemy. Now he committed blasphemy. We sentence you to death. That was it. The whole accusation. That's all they needed. So that's where we pick it up in, in chapter 15 of Mark in the first verse. And we see Jesus on the third stage of this trial appearing again once more before the Sanhedrin, before the Supreme Court, if you will. Now notice that it says there, it says as soon as, as it was morning, as soon as daybreak, as soon as it, the sun broke out, the chief priests held a consultation. It doesn't say a trial. They did a consultation. Now, why is that? That is because they knew that what they had done the night before was completely illegal. So they just needed to meet at daybreak to give people the opportunity to come see it. Declare the man guilty again. They didn't hold a trial. They didn't hear the defense. They didn't hear anything. They just declare him again. He's a blasphemer. We sentence you to death. We're done. And now we can look at our people and say we did it legally. Right? So I want you to catch this. The chief priests rejected the truth. See, here we have. Here we have the religious leaders of Israel. These people were the experts on the law of Moses. They were the experts on the prophets. They were the experts on what we call the, the Old Testament, right? They knew it left and right, backwards and forwards. They knew it completely. They were the ones teaching the people what the Scripture said. These people were without excuse. They knew that a Messiah was coming. They knew what he was going to go through. They knew what it was going to happen. And yet they decided to reject the truth. Jesus himself in John 5, 39 said, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. See, they had no excuse. If they had been studying the scriptures, they knew Jesus was coming. They should have recognized them. But instead, when that truth faced them, they decided to break the mirror and reject it. And I have to confess to you that this happens to me many times. You know, many times somebody will come with good intentions to throw a truth in my face and say, Jose, man, this, I don't want to hear it. That's me, man. That might not be you, but that's me. I don't want to hear it. And you have no right. Huh? Have you ever heard that one? You have no right to tell me. <laughs> Some are smiling, right? Has it happened to you? Maybe your wife has confronted you with your addiction. You're like, leave me alone. 
I work hard enough. Maybe your parent has confronted you with your laziness and you're like, ah, please, you're always in my face. I don't know, you fill in the blank. The point is this, when confronted with truth and you know that it's true, what do you do? Do you reject it? See, the priests rejected the truth. They rejected the Messiah that they had been waiting for. They rejected the fact that and ended up crucifying the one they thought they were serving. I mean, all their lives they dedicated it to God. They were serving God and they end up crucifying God. I hope you're listening this morning. You know, when truth stares you at the face, man, don't reject it. I know it's painful. I know it is. But don't reject it. Now, once the priests were done with Jesus, they brought him before Pilate. Now, that, that trial also had three stages. We're not going to cover that. But in your first five verses here, you only have stage one of that trial. Then after that, he goes to Herod. And then he comes back to Pilate. And that's where it picks up in verse 6. So we're not going to go through all of that. But you can find that on your own. But, but Pilate was the governor representing Rome. At that time, he, had, he was a governor for 10 years there. And Pilate was a cruel leader. He was considered incompetent. He was considered heavy-handed by many historical uh, sources. History say that he created turmoil within the Jewish community on more than one occasion by insulting the religious beliefs. Actually, Luke 13.1 even says that he mixed the blood of the martyred martyr Galileans with the blood of the sacrifice in the temple. Now, you can imagine what this will cause with the Jewish people. So needless to say, he was in hot waters with the Jewish people. But he was also in hot waters with Rome because they didn't like it when the Jewish people were violent and created riots and things like that. They wanted peace. They wanted prosperity. prosperity. That's all they wanted. So he was in hot waters with Rome. He was in hot waters with the Jewish people. And that's important for us to understand. Now, if you remember, what were the charges against Jesus? Blasphemy, right? He, he, he blasphemed, so now you got to die. Well, guess what? Pilate could care less about blasphemy. He didn't care about the religion at all. So those charges wouldn't have fly through in the Roman court. So what do they do? These religious leaders, they change the charges. Look with me in Luke 23, verse 1. It says, then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. It's the same thing that Mark said, right? Verse 2 says, and then they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ a king. Now, did you see that there? They're saying that Jesus Christ told them not to pay taxes to Caesar. Well, that's not what I remember. You remember when he saw the coin and he said, whose inscription is in there? And they said, Caesar. And he said, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. But now they're saying, hey, Pilate, he's forbidding us to pay taxes. And then he's saying he is the king. Well, now that was a serious accusation before Rome. Because Rome only had one king. And that was Caesar. And if you call yourself a king, you were a traitor. And you didn't want to pay taxes. You were a traitor. And now that, in the eyes of Rome, deserved the death penalty. You see, what they wanted was a death penalty. They could care less how they got it. Now, it's interesting because we see the hypocrisy of the, of the religious leaders right there. First of all, they, they lied to themselves in their own trial to find him guilty of, of a guilt that, that will recommend the death penalty. Right? They, they played around until finally they found something. Then they lied to Pilate so that he can give him the death penalty as well. But they're such hypocrites that in John 18, 28, it says that they will not enter the governor's headquarters so that they will not be defiled but could eat the Passover. Did you see that? <laughs> These guys were insane. We won't go into the court because we want to celebrate the Passover. Oh, but we can lie to ourselves. We can lie to Pilate so we can kill an innocent man. 
Now, before we go on hammering them, let me, let me tell you, that is the exact same place that lying will take you. You know, it will confuse you to the point where you forget what truth is and what is not. It will confuse you to the point that it will even make you forget your own principles. I mean, I've done it, so I know. It's like, it's like a web that is difficult to break and is impossible to escape. Now, it's interesting to me that um, I've changed my opinion about Pilate in the last week as I studied this, this scripture. Pilate was a pretty smart guy. He was a pretty smart guy because it's interesting to me that he was able to look through that web of lies and come out with some interesting conclusions, some true conclusions. First of all, Pilate concluded that Jesus was innocent. Pilate concluded that Jesus was innocent. In Luke 23, 4, it says, I find no guilt in this man. And then in verse 14, he says it again, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. This guy is innocent. I mean, Pilate asked the right questions and he believed Jesus. And you know what happened? He saw Jesus for who he really was. Secondly, we see that Pilate was amazed. The Bible says that he was amazed at Jesus' silence before all the false accusations. We saw that in verse 5. And this is important because I don't know you, but most of us, if not all of us, will defend ourselves when we're falsely accused, wouldn't you? I mean, many of us, are, we won't respond to many things, but somebody comes and makes a false accusation in your face. I don't know you. I'm there, baby. Let's get it on. We'll defend ourselves. Remember one time somebody was going to come and, and accuse me of something, and they started opening their mouth and saying something. I said, oh, hold on one second. I called Pastor Brian. I said, Brian, come over here, man. You need to sit here. I'm about to get accused of something. I'm defending myself. <laughs> I'm defending myself. Only a truly innocent man can stand there, hear false accusations without saying a word. And Pilate was amazed at that. The only chance that Jesus had to defend himself was speaking to Pilate. He decided not to. Thirdly, Pilate perceived that all this was done out of envy. You saw it on verse 10. It says, for he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. See? He knew that Jesus was innocent. He knew that he was amazed at his silence. And he knew it was done out of envy. See, the issue is this. As smart as Pilate was, and, and as he even moving up the political ladder in Rome, which was difficult to, to be one of the elite, you know, one of the governors, regardless of his great perception and regardless of all that knowledge that he gained, Pilate, out of selfish ambition or out of fear for the crowd or out of fear for Rome, he decided to do what? To ignore the truth. He decided to ignore the truth. See, instead of making a decision, instead of basing his decision on the facts that he found, he became weak, he became indecisive, and he gave in to the multitude. Have you done that lately? Have you given into the pressure? Have you given into peer pressure? Have you given into, uh, into the, the mentality of our culture and say, well, everybody's doing so, it should be all right? What are you basing your decisions on? Are you finding out truth like Pilate did and then ignoring it? Or are you using it to make your decisions? Listen, ignoring the truth can bring you horrible consequences, just like rejecting the truth. You know, recently my wife and I were watching the, the true crime series on the Melinda's brother. Anybody watch that? 
you know, if you live here in the 80s, you remember that was all over the news, everything that was happening. And, and so when this came out, we decided, let's, let's watch it and see what, what is new. And here was a father that was abusing his child, his two children, since they were little. And as sick as this man was, and as sick as that was, sicker still is that the mother sat back knowing the truth and decided to ignore it. See, ignorance of the truth will bring catastrophic results. And so now we have two young guys that killed their father and mother and are still in jail to this day for that crime. Now we come to the part in the verses where it was a custom for Roman to, for the Roman government to release a prisoner during that time of the year. I don't know why, maybe to, to gain favor before the Jews or something. And Pilate wanted to release Jesus. It's interesting to me that in John 19 it says, from then on Pilate sought to release him. Pilate wanted to release Jesus. He just didn't want to make the decision himself. He wanted the crowd to make the decision for him. He wanted to release him. But it says there, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, listen to what they said, you are not Caesar's friend. They didn't tell him, hey, if you don't release it, we're going to get upset. Oh, no. Pilate, if you don't release it, I'm going to get on my cell phone. I'm going to call Caesar himself. Say, hey, Caesar, you know what just happened? This guy claims to be a king, and guess who let him go? That's death for Pilate. Hmm. So he was so blinded by his selfish ambition that he gave into the crowd. And he did what they wanted. And the crowd was so blinded by the religious leaders and probably by their own hatred that they decided to release a known criminal, Barabbas, and crucify an innocent man. Wow. Interesting to me that Jesus could have defended himself. He could have. But he knew his purpose. See, Jesus knew why he had come. He could have opened his mouth and, and, and Pilate would have believed him. That's the kicker. Pilate was believing him. But he knew his purpose. Jesus had come to die on the cross. See, he came to pay the price of our sin in order that we could have a relationship with God. My friend, that is truth. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. That's what he came to do. He came to pay the wages of our sin. It says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Matthew 20, 28 says Jesus came to give his life as ransom for many. That is truth. Let me ask you some questions. Are you bound by sin in your life? Is there something that has, has got you bound right now? Are you following the cultural majority and allowing their truth to be your truth? Are you so offended with the man or the woman in the mirror that you'd rather break it than face it? If you answer yes to any of those questions, I want to ask you one more question. And it's a question that Pilate asked. And I think it's the most important question you can ask yourself this morning. Right there in verse 12, he has this question. Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? That is the question for you this morning. That is the question for me. Then what shall I do with this man we call Jesus Christ? What shall we do? Here, my friend, is the truth. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus came to seek and save that that was lost. Jesus came to die on the cross to pay the price for your sin and my sin. And he rose again from the grave to give you a chance at eternal life 
with God the Father. That is truth. That is truth. And there's only three things you can do with it. You can ignore it. You can reject it. And remember, the results will be the same. Or you can accept it and allow it to transform your life forever. Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? Jesus said it this way. Jesus said he is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. And he said, and no one comes to the Father but through him. That is truth with a capital T. So what will you do with him today? What will you do with the truth today? I invite you to stand up. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, man, it's so simple. He already did it all. He already paid it all. What we have to do is repent of our sins and believe by faith that what he did on the cross is the finished work. If you repent this morning and you believe in Christ, you will have eternal life. And he will restore you. He will allow you to pursue the beautiful design that he's got for you in your life. But my friend, you have to answer the question. I can't answer it for you. You have to do it. What will you do with truth this morning? What will you do with Jesus this morning? Don't ignore it. Either reject them or accept them. But you have to answer the question. If you want to know how to come to Jesus, how to accept him as your Lord and Savior, listen, I'll be down here. Pastor Brian will be here. I'm sure our deacons and our elders will be here to answer any questions you may have. But today is the day of salvation. And what a better way to start Easter week than accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and accepting truth. Would you pray with me? Lord God, Father, this morning we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth in your word, Lord. Father, I thank you that you have allowed us to, to hear it, to read it, to understand it, Father. And Father, it is only through the Holy Spirit that we can understand it. So Father, I pray for those that, that perhaps are Christian and they have been living a, a lie, Father. They've been following the cultural majority. They've been doing things that they shouldn't be doing, Father. They've been ignoring the truth. Father, I pray that today they will ask for your forgiveness. Oh, Father, how I pray for those that haven't met you yet, that don't know you as their Lord and Savior, Father. Father, I pray that today, as they heard the truth of your word, as they heard of who is truth, pray that they will accept him and allow him to change their lives forever, even to eternity, Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus.